Peter Clayton, how are you? I am fine. Welcome everyone to The Garage, the Court of Public Opinion. But if you're not watching us on Facebook, I hope you're listening to us on a podcast. Wherever you get your favourite podcasts from, uh, Ozcast is the one we're going to use as our main support for running the radio station when we get all that up in the coming weeks. But I, I think there are, I think uh, Jeremy Cordo's Court of Public Opinion pops up on all sorts of different platforms, uh, all sorts of different providers of podcasts. Doesn't matter where you're watching it, if you are watching it, thank you. Thank you for supporting the a voice that I think is, uh, it's the voice of, I like to think, the majority, but I have to be realistic. No, I think it's the voice of the majority. <laughs> I like to think it's the voice of the majority, but I flick around sometimes with the news programs and I wonder where the hell the minds of people in Australia, particularly the newsrooms of Australia, just wonder where they are. Anyway, before we get to some stuff to chew on. Uh, July the 19th, auspicious if you're interested in uh, space, uh, as I suppose we all are going to be because the future, is, the future is fascinating with regard to what we can do, what the, uh, what the adventurousness of human nature can do. 1969, Apollo 11. Apollo 11 goes into moon orbit and over the next few days of course there will be different stages of that incredible adventure. I'll tell you some of the things that uh, because they, it wasn't only hairy times for the people on that spacecraft. As far as the communications were concerned they were very hairy as well. And Australia played an enormously important part. Uh, Tidbin Biller, uh, Honeysuckle, um, we were vital. In fact, we actually got the signals from the moon before the Americans. But the way we covered it back in the days when I was at Channel 10, back in 1969, about this week, it's hard to imagine that it's all those years ago I remember those days as clearly as anything. Uh, uh, the, the, the enthusiasm with which we all approached it, no one was on any overtime or anything. We worked 24 hours a day and were grateful and enthusiastic about it. It was fantastic. But I'll tell you more about it. I'll tell you as the days go by and the mission continues. Uh, what else? If I mentioned the name David Warren to you, you probably wouldn't know who the hell that was. Pete, do you know who he is? No. David Warren. Very, very interesting guy. He was the fellow. 2010, David Warren, Australian scientist and inventor. Now, he sadly dies at the age of 85, but he left his mark in the world and in a very good way by having invented the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. In other words, the black box. An Australian invention which is carried in most aeroplanes around the world. And uh, I used to think they were only carried in the big planes, but no, they are in smaller planes as well. The black box, which by the way isn't black, it's uh, orange. 1961, the first in-flight movie was shown by TWA. Hey, I wonder what it was. 1961. <laughs> it would have been good, I'm sure. Adolf Hitler orders Great Britain to surrender. Well, of course he would. Uh, they decline, a little note here, they decline. The year was 1940. A little premature, Adolf. 1941, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill launches his V for Victory campaign. The BBC World Service begins playing V for Victory in Morse code. Them's were the days. 
2017, U.S. scientists calculate total amount of plastic ever produced at 8.3 billion tons, equal to the weight of one billion elephants. <laughs> Doesn't matter how you look at it, it's sort of like unintended consequences. Nobody thought that this marvellous invention of plastic would ever be the problem that it turned out to be. Uh, you got to think over the horizon. Hey, Pete. Yes. Sam Colt, American inventor, firearms manufacturer, industrialist. The year was 1814. He was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He died in 1862, which is just into the Civil War. And what's the best cult he ever came up with? Oh, the Peacemaker. Oh, that was the famous one, wasn't it? The Six Shooter. But he died in 62. Yes. His favourite gun was the 1861 Navy. Is that the one with a smooth undercarriage, or is it...? Yes, it's the one you just bought. Was that the, the antique one I got? Yes, that's his favourite too. Uh, oh, wow, wow. They're just beautiful things, you know. They're kind of like works of art, pieces of jewellery. Uh, but from a technical or engineering point of view, they were something. James Garner, American actor, Rockford Files, Breck Maverick. He was also in The Great Escape too. And uh, Space Cowboys. With Clint Eastwood, he was in that as well. Um, he uh, was born in 1928. He died in uh, 2014. Now that would make him what? Um, 85, 86? It's a good age, I suppose. I, 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 when I get to 86, I'm not going to be saying that. <laughs> I say, no, I, I've got a few more years. I got a few more years. Uh, Tom and Jerry first appeared uh, under their own names in a cartoon. It was called Midnight Snack. William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, 1941. Wow. Benedict Cumberbatch, British actor, 12 years a slave. Sherlock, the in imitation game, uh, Dr. Strange in the Marvel movies. The, imi the imitation game, that was all about the, the breaking of the Enigma code, wasn't it? I remember seeing that. Very good actor. 1976. He was born in London. American saloon singer, it says here. Frank Sinatra, 50. Marries American actress, Mia Farrow. She was 21 at Los Angeles, no, Las Vegas, Nevada, the home of the casino executive Jack Entranter, divorced in 1968, two-year marriage. Uh, Elvis Presley's debut single, a cover version of That's All Right, Mama, is released by Sun Records, Sam Phillips Sun Records, on this day in 1954. Yes, Brian May, British rock guitarist, Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody. We are the champions, born London, 1947. I'll give you one more. Joe Flynn, American character actor, McHale's Navy. Oh yeah, Captain Bing Binghamton. Captain Binghamton in, the, in the McHale's Navy. He was in The Love Bug. Uh, he dies of a heart attack while swimming in his pool. He was 49 years old in 1974. When he was in McHale's Navy, he looked a lot older in McHale's Navy than 49, and that was way before he died. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. We all age differently. That's the, that's the thing. There was something I wanted to show you. <laughs> uh, people send me the most wonderful stuff. Nick. Nick, thank you. Nick. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you doubt... If you doubt me, this is it. <laughs> Nick. He says, Love Labour playing the charade of poor man's politics while at the same time enriching themselves but with burgeoning property portfolios. 
the politicians are playing us all for fools, delivering no benefit to anyone except for themselves. They are screwing us. So screw them, the gravy train that they're on as well. And the point of that tirade is uh, the political property ladder. <laughs> well, you sort of don't think of these Labour people as being, you know, entrepreneurs and um, uh, property developers, do you? No? Linda Burney. Linda Burney. Her seat is, um, if I can read it, Barton in New South Wales. She owns five, five properties. Her income from those five properties is $7,200 a week. She lives in Marrickville, where the income, average income is $2,170. That's all up. Her income just from her investment properties is $7,200. Tony Burke, uh, he is the member for Watson in New South Wales. He has four investment properties with an income of 7,300. Lives in Punchbowl, where the average income is $1,384 a week. Um, keep in mind these people are on $200,000 plus dollars with their parliamentary salary and, and uh, benefits and whatnot. Uh, Anthony Albanese, Grain Loan, New South Wales, it says here he has four investment properties. I heard it was five investment properties, but I haven't done all the research. His income from those on a weekly basis, this is a week, $10,846 a week on top of his parliamentary prime ministerial salary. Richard Miles, Corio Victoria, his seat. He has three investment properties, returning him $8,755. Penny Wong in South Australia, it says she has three investment properties, returning her $7,826 a week. Uh, Amanda Rishworth, uh, Kingston here in South Australia, three investment properties. She has an extra income on top of her parliamentary salary of $7,200 a week. Uh, um, Brendan O'Connor in Victoria, his seat is uh, Gorton in Victoria, $7,200 a week from his three investment properties. Per property. They must be very, very expensive properties too. I don't know. I don't even know how to sort of <coughs> I think it's probably best I just don't <laughs> don't comment on it. But you just get you just get the the drift. This is uh, Nick who sent me that. Uh, obviously did a lot of research. I am assuming it's right, Nick. But uh, are those properties negatively geared? Be very hypocritical if they had negatively geared properties and then they came out against negative gearing, which basically gives the average Australian battler the only opportunity that he or she has to get ahead in life. You see, what I would like to do would be to see these people who have obviously done well for themselves done well for themselves. Why don't they, instead of following this lesser, inferior philosophy of socialism, which is, you know, the, the least amount of work for the most amount of money over the shortest number of hours kind of thing, you know, why not create some sort of mentality that says you have to look after yourself and let us, the government, provide the tools to help you achieve financial independence. So you don't have to worry about pensions, you don't have to worry about other people looking after you. The government, for example, the taxpayer. They're doing it themselves. Why wouldn't they do it, set up something whereby we all had the same setup?
they know after all from their own personal experience that it works now I want to talk to you about the the uh, Hollywood thing the artists the Hollywood actors the film stars in other words have joined the screen the screenwriters and the other people who are out on strike I think the screenwriters have been out since May it's pretty amazing this sort of thing hasn't happened in 60 years you see I, I, I've got a romantic idea of film stars uh, there are people who are above things like being on a salary working for a living uh, contracts deals things like that oh you hear about the backroom deals and the managers with the big cigars and all that sort of stuff but we like to think of them as being above money but when you think about it when you look at it you analyze it the truth is nothing has changed strip away all of the glitz and year after year after year it's a struggle it is a struggle there's a handful of people, yes, on multi-million dollar salaries, yes. However, most in this glamorous business of show business are on a very, very small salary, small money. But the evidence of that is the anger that's emerged. Partly because of their fear of losing their jobs, but most importantly, it's the fear of being replaced by machines and frankly you know in all honesty that's a fear we all should have I am with the actors I'm with the writers and I'm with the union the fear and the paranoia over AI artificial intelligence for example is real but let's have some perspective I don't know if I was a bus driver and the bus company came up with a new technology, an automated bus that worked, my job would be gone. I mean, even doctors, surgeons face the prospect of robots being able to perform more accurate surgery. I was talking to you about the black box in the aeroplanes. You know, if you were a pilot, there's been a thing called an autopilot for years. <laughs> now this is just the beginning. God knows where it is going to lead, let alone end. But what I'm thinking is we have to be flexible. We have to understand everything is moving. Everything is on the table all the time. Unfortunately, the law does not keep up with technology. Going back to the, the, the actors and the voiceover people, that cannot be in any way duplicated or replicated or automated in any way at any time. Now that would presumably relieve the anxiety of these people who are in fear of being replaced by a robot, artificial intelligence. But I'm sorry. The world is not a secure place, no industry is safe, everything is fluid, fast moving. Look at radio today. I see radio stations as I have known them and loved them. But I have to be realistic, got to get rid of the romantic idea, they are really a thing of the past. The future is this, where you can, without a television station, you can see what I'm doing here in the Court of Public Opinion on Facebook, and you can listen as a podcast. The future is the broadcast online. It obviates not only the stupid censorship and controls of government, but it's cheaper. It's cheaper to own and operate and run. And it's, it's easier. You don't need infrastructure, the transmitter, the landlines, and dare I say it, the staff, which is perhaps the saddest thing of all. The radio business is changing. 
like just about every other business you can think of. And when 5AA sacked me, they did me an incredible favour. Because friends like Pete opened my eyes and said, you don't need the radio station or a broadcasting licence. Who would have thought that? We must have this ability to be nimble, flexible, see things that are changing and try to get ahead of the game, ahead of the curve. We mustn't ever let ourselves be victims of change. We must be the beneficiaries of change. The poor me thing doesn't even work for Aboriginals. How do I seize the day? That's the question. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. That's how we must think. Whether we're a bus driver or an actor, a surgeon, a broadcaster, change and technology are with us all the time. And yes, if they could replace us, they would. That's life. But always, change is inevitable and eventually good if we seize the moment. And have I got time to go on a bit further or not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh dear. I wanted to say this because I thought, talking about opportunity, it's a stupid thought I know. But because of all this strike action in America, the writers, the actors, the directors, everyone in American entertainment seems to be on strike, it's a very unionized industry over there. And of course, we here have a very unionized government in Australia. What I mean is that the unions own the Labour Party, right from the get-go. The Labour Party, and therefore the government, couldn't possibly take advantage of what's going on in the United States, but they should. You see, if they were a little bit more free-thinking, the emphasis being on the word free, they could offer the producers and the studios of the United States of America the wonderful opportunity to come to Australia and make their movies and their television series here. <sighs> With all of the benefits of employment that that would throw up. But of course the government couldn't do that because the unions wouldn't let them. That would be strike-breaking. We would be scabs. Can't break the strike. What a load of crap. But watch. Here's an opportunity. If you're a prisoner of the left and you do what you're told, it is possible that you could break out of that and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what's right for the workers of Australia the economy of Australia and we're going to seize the opportunity. That's the sort of country I want to live in. Thank you so much for viewing the Court of Public Opinion. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Pete and I will be back tomorrow. Believe in yourself and goodbye for now.